Okay, okay, let's get started so we can give Sam some time. Sam's on chance uh, is serving today, and several people are too, so they're going to need to leave a little bit early. Uh, I want to introduce you first to, to Bridget DeHart. Bridget is here. Bridget and her husband started visiting Wilshire around Thanksgiving and then in earnest around Christmas, so uh, we're glad you're here. And uh, thank you. So we'll, we'll get you a name tag for next week. Um, and Sam, and all of you know Sam, and Sam Tinsley's teaching today, and his uh, daughter in law is on the chancel today, I think, as, as you'll see. Uh, Sarah. Okay, let's go through our church wide announcements. Um, that Laura has picked up for me here. I do want you to read Katie Murray's um, book, Preparing for Worship on page two. But um, let's see here. here. On page nine, uh, Super Bowl of Caring is today. Yes. And this is a great thing to give to fight uh, hunger. Um, and they said we'd love to send $6,000 for that, for, to, uh, for our total support of $15,000. So that's on page nine. Look at that. Ariel uh, Maribel is starting on February 12th. I think he's coming in town this week, isn't he, or something? Or? He's, he's here. here. He's here. Yeah. This okay. week is here. Okay. Yes. All right. So there we go. Uh, Timothy, you speak at a Baylor event. That's on page nine. Um, ah, here's congratulations. Last week's guest was Rachel's father, one of one of our five guests from last week, and it says Rachel and Sam Murphy are on the birth of, of their son Roger on January 29th. You see that on page nine. Uh, planning to see uh, see see twelve. 21 global on page 10 and does anybody know any more about this about about this on page 10 about 12 21 global i think this is what we're giving yes. the money to that's our super bowl is carrying yeah. this yeah. okay very good. from today's super bowl all sure. right yeah. it's true. uh you'll see a nice note from charlie fuller on page 11 and uh, Charlie will be back, uh, and then Charlie has asked to teach our class at some point in time, so he's going to be doing that. So uh, that would be great. Um, Rise Against Hunger is on page 11 also. Okay, doing the work of Lent. If you can come on Wednesday night, uh, uh, Timothy's doing a good job on doing uh, the, the work, you know, some of the, the, the work of Christmas, and the, but at any rate, this is uh, on Wednesday nights, but on page 12, Doing the work of Lent uh, starts on Sunday, the February 18th, and Easter's early. It's like the 31st of March or something. It's pretty yes. early this year. Yeah. So uh, Ash Wednesday is coming up on February 14th. Hey, Dale. Um, this is birthday. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's it. And uh, I've got several, several, several cousins or twins here. I think um, volunteers um, at White Rock uh, Center of Hope are needed. On, uh, on you'll see on page 13, um, the Christians by Lucas. I don't know how to pronounce the last name. H N A T H. Not yes. Um, that's on page 13. You'll see that. That's on February 15th. Uh, Wednesday night live um, is is coming Wednesday. Is on page 14. And Scott Spire, uh, who's who um, hadn't taught for us before, but he's, he sits right on the other side of that wall in uh, Epiphany. So anyway, he's our Iron Wilson today. Are there any other church-wide announcements that I missed that we ought to go through or go over? <coughs> Did you mention the Greg Beard thing in Baylor? I, I just mentioned that, that Timothy's going to be uh, there. I, I highly recommend that. Greg Garrett uh, is a marvelous, he preached here uh, yes, All Saints Day a year ago. And it was one of the best sermons I've ever heard, I do believe. And you can sign in to that, it's free. You can see it on Zoom or whatever they call it. And uh, I highly recommend it. Timothy is actually presenting at that on Friday night that week. I think it's February 18th. I think that that's right. right. And I believe. Yeah, Timothy's on the program that night. So February 15th. You might want to just dial that page, up. Page 9. Yeah. yeah. It's on page 9. Yeah. And let me tell you a little about Sam. Sam was one of the first okay. people of our time met when we were here and remembered our name. He's in Compass class. That was our, it was our home class back then. And um, Sam was a, his, was a professor uh, in, in math. If you ever want to know a math joke or whatever, this is your man. <laughs> he has got some great ones. But Sam, uh, his, his daughter-in-law, uh, his uh, daughter-in-law is on chancel today, <coughs> Price's uh, wife, Sarah. And, um, but Sam is just a great guy. He's one of the three amigos. If, if, who does repair work for people in the church, 
if they've got something broken down or whatever, if there's something they can do. I know they did a mailbox for Heather, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and it's just really, really, really nice things. But anyway, Sam, we're glad you're here. Thanks, thanks for taking thanks for thank all you. part of this. Yeah. Uh, some of you may know, and I'm not asking for any kind of thing here, but I, I need to let you know that I'm in voice therapy right now. Can you hear me back there okay? Yes. Okay. I'm also hearing challenge, so if you guys out there, would you, would, would, if you could use your outside voice, <laughs> your first grade voice, if you would do that, please. <laughs> You can interpret Aaron. Okay, my wife is always my interpreter when I when I wind up teaching. So, uh, so anyway, thank you, Dennis, for that wonderful introduction. That's a, that's as good as I've had, I guess. I'm also known around here as Sam. I am. So, uh, Joe and Claudia Barner's younger son Todd, when he was about three, I guess, called me Sam. I am, and it stuck. And I kind of like it. I send emails that way sometime and all that. And Ivan and Jerry, as he mentioned, we're a part of the, I'm a part of the Three Amigos. Now, we do not do complete kitchen renovations. <laughs> oh. uh, we're not really wanting to install commodes or anything like that, but if you got something that you think might, now we'll come and look at it, and we might tell you, Barbara, uh, you need to hire somebody to do that. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so anyway, you understand I'm a numbers guy, and in fact I bought that book, I bought that book, uh, Bible, Bible for Dummies, you know, so uh, uh, numbers is what I do. There's even a book in the Bible, Numbers, did you know that? Yes. And I looked at that thing and I thought, there's no numbers in here, I mean, it's all about kings and a whole bunch of stuff like that, so, uh, but I do come from a Baptist background. When I was uh, when I was about 13, my dad committed himself to be a lay minister. So I'm Baptist to the core. But I started out as a Methodist. In fact, I noticed Scott Spryer. Is it Spryer that we say his name? Spryer. Mm -hmm. yes. Scott Spryer this morning in in his uh, biography that's in there. He said he's been sprinkled, splashed, and baptized. And I've only been sprinkled and baptized, but I got it covered. Okay? Scott is in. I mean, he, he's good to go. So, uh, so anyway, my dad always had a small church, and I was indoctrinated into Baptist life. Uh, Y'all know about that stuff. Some of you are my age or... You no, know, I... No, they all all run yes. people. So, uh, <laughs> so anyway, you know about Sunday morning, Sunday night, training union, mm -hmm. RAs, GAs, sword drills. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget the preacher's son was a little bit older than I was, and he was in high school, and I was interested in math at that time, still am. And uh, he said, I asked him what he was studying, and I was a ninth grader, and he said, oh, we're studying logs. And I could just imagine we were going to be taking logs and cutting them up, you know. And logs. I didn't realize what that really was, but that kind of got me started. I have a Bible that in the back of it, I've got algebra equations that I solved during church. <laughs> and on Sunday night, y'all remember they'd have boards up and they'd have how many were attended and how many brought their Bible and all that stuff. Well, I'd add those up and teacher taught us how to do something called casting out nines, so uh, I learned how to do that there. I did pay attention some, though. <laughs> and Peggy and I went to Washtenaw Baptist up in Arkansas, and then I went to graduate school at Ole Miss. So, uh, and then we wound up here at Wilshire, and here we are, 50 some odd years later. So, I'm happy to be here with you. Who wrote all these scriptures up here, these extra ones? Me. <laughs> Who's taking responsibility? He's done. Yeah. Come on, Brian. <laughs> Brian did that. <laughs> I never would have taken the blame for it. <laughs> okay, well, I just I just got the first ones there. So what I'd like for you to do is, is start with that today. And I'd like to read it twice. So I'd, I'd like to have one of you read it. If you would for us, and what version is it that you guys use? NRS Standard Version. Revised Standard Version. Okay. Well, since you're the troublemaker, you want to read it for us? <laughs> hey, he's got a great voice too. 
the believers share their possessions. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. There was a Levite, a native of Cyprus, Joseph, to whom the apostles gave the name Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. Mm -hmm. He sold a field that belonged to him, then brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Wow. Okay, well, I'd like to read it from another version. And uh, as I'm reading this, I'd like you to tell me what stands out there. Is there anything that, you know, that just jumps off the page at you that says, there's a couple of things in there that I read it. When I read it the second or third time, I went, oh my goodness, really? So it says, all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions were their own, but they shared everything they had. Timothy sent me for this for a, for a stewardship campaign, if you're listening real close. <laughs> okay, you hear this? Okay. All right, so uh, with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it in the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Okay. Does anything stand out there for you? I always thought there ought to be a Barnabas ministry like a Stephen ministry. A son, you know, I always thought there should be a Barnabas ministry like a Stephen ministry for encouragement. <laughs> you know. Yeah, we, we ought think... to have a Barnabas ministry, shouldn't we? Why yeah, I feel like maybe... Joseph? Say again? Why couldn't he keep his name Joseph? Yeah. Okay. Why couldn't he keep his Why name Joseph? Why couldn't he keep the name Joseph? That's a good question. I knew it would be. Wish I had a good answer. <laughs> I don't know why they decided to name him Barnabas. And, and by the way, it's not B-U-S, it's B-A-S. So uh, he had a good Barnabas. So Thank you. <laughs> that was me. Oh, I, I only know because I studied for this lesson, you see. He was actually born in Cyprus which is a, one of the Greek islands, you know, and we missed that when we were on a trip about a year and a half ago. We made it to Crete and then over to Sicily, but we didn't make Cyprus, but it, it, that's where he came from. And uh, as, you, as you heard in the scripture, his name has been Son of Encouragement. Well, one of the things that stood out to me was that opening verse that said all the believers were in one heart and one mind. Don't you wish we had that? <laughs> Must have been a small group. <laughs> Maybe they weren't bad. Yes, that's right. This is why they had a Yeah. Well, of course, who was Barnabas' buddy in all of this stuff? Mark. Paul, oh, right. Paul and Barnabas did that. You know, we What's call that? it travels. Travels of Paul. <laughs> which it makes a, there's a joke that goes on at small Baptist colleges that these two guys were taking a New Testament class. And uh, they were more interested in partying and playing, playing intramural softball or whatever it was they were doing that spring. And they didn't pay much attention to the class. And about two weeks before the class is over, they got their grade to see where they were, and they absolutely had to pass the final exam or they were not going to pass the course. So they found a file in, in their fraternity file that the old man had given, and he always asked the question, discuss the travels of Paul. 
So man, they, they, they got really up to speed on the travels of Paul. So they go into the final exam and they open their test booklets and one of them, both of them looked at it and went, oh my, it said, discuss the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> <laughs> so one guy, one of the two guys just wrote on his paper, Dear Prof, I'll see you next semester. <laughs> the end of the paper. The other guy sat there and wrote and wrote and wrote. His buddy went back after about an hour, looked in the classroom. He's still there writing, just writing away like this. He went back over to the student union. They agreed they were going to meet for a cup of coffee over there afterward. His buddy came walking in the student union. He said, what in the world were you doing in there? What, what were you writing about? He said, well, I just wrote on there, Far be it from me to expound on the words of our Lord in the Sermon on the Mount. As for me, I shall discuss the travels of Paul. <laughs> so uh, I, I have a feeling he didn't pass the class, either, but he wrote a lot anyway. So, uh, so this, uh, as we look at things today, uh, Dennis sent me out these things. Uh, where do you find yourself in this story? So where do you find yourself in this story? I find myself kind of feeling uncomfortable in this story. You know that we have a lot of things. Most of us here uh, are pretty well off. All you got to do is drive around town and look. We come into church this morning. We see two people standing out in the median, Northwest Highway and Garland Road, a little median strip about this wide, and they're standing there, of course, asking for donations. And I thought, wow, I thought about this verse. So, where do you see yourself in this story? Don Ray, where do you see yourself in this story? I don't know, right in the middle of it, I guess. I was thinking at one time, and I don't know if I had it Good to meet you. Thank you. The committee of coming up I think that was way back in the Anyway, the whole deal was uh, anybody we found out about that needed something, it went to that committee. They took care of it. Mm -hmm. And we may still have that. I don't know. You know, we have all kinds of committees. Mm -hmm. We have well benevolent. We have all kinds of things that we don't hear about. Mm -hmm. uh, and so maybe we still have that. And growing up, I guess I've been very fortunate, or maybe not. I've never been in a situation yet where everybody was starving that I, or nobody was starving that I knew about. Uh, very fortunate where I, where I grew up. Uh, no rich, no poor, but, but a whole lot of people in between. Uh, and, and so I can't really say that growing up I knew anybody that didn't have uh, all they needed, or that I was aware of anyway. And now, and Wilshire has been pretty much that same thing, although we're always behind the budget, we're always needing more things, <laughs> but we always seem to make it at the end of the year. Every now and then we don't. Uh, you know, one of the things that I, <coughs> I've read a lot of, y'all know the name of Robbie Jones, Robert P. Jones? No? Write that name down. If you got a pencil, you need to write that name down. He wrote a book called White Too Long. Mm -hmm. He also wrote a book, uh, The Hidden, let's see, The Hidden Secrets of White Supremacy. Uh, Robbie is from Jackson, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And uh, he and Greg Garrett, the guy I mentioned a while ago, are good friends. And they've done a lot of stuff together. I think Robbie's going to be there. In fact, there's talk that Robbie Jones and Greg Garrett are going to be coming here to do a little seminar thing. And if they do come, you, you will absolutely love them, I'm pretty sure. Okay? So, uh, Sandra, where, where do you find yourself in this story? Do you find any... Sandra, Sandra went to Washita with my sister. <laughs> my sister graduated before I did, and Sandra was in the same... We didn't call them sororities there, they call social clubs yes. you know, in the Baptist Church. So Sandra, we met and finally we made connections and, and I asked her if she knew Jean Fitzgerald, Jean, actually Jean Tinsley then, and she said, oh yeah, we were in the E's together, she said. So yes, where do you find yourself in this story? Well, certainly not poor. Um, 
I guess I'm like you. I feel a little uncomfortable with it. it I'm surprised we don't uh, think more about socialism mm -hmm. whenever we read this. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we're not there. Mm -hmm. so, a question. Yeah. What is the context of this particular passage? The context of this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I went back and read the first of the chapter, and it, you know, Acts, I think, I'm not the biblical scholar now, but uh, Acts, I think, is sort of a setup book for the travels of Paul and Barnabas. I think that's kind of the idea. That it, I mean, it, it's more than that, of course, but that's one of the things it does. I think that's the context it is. Mm -hmm. And there had been... Uh, there had been persecution amongst the apostles before this, too, so they're in a pretty troubling time right now in this thing. Yes, sir. We had a, a friend go to this church, and she retired, and she wanted something to do, and, uh, and then there's some, several people who work at the White Rock Center of Hope, and so she went over there, and she'd worked for a construction company. She was used to dealing with some pretty uh, difficult things, and we put her on the front desk. They said, nobody wants to say no. And I can say no. Mm. Because you're at the front desk and you've got a limited amount. You're going to run out of bus passes. You're going to run out of all sorts. You've got a limited amount of stuff. And somebody will come in, you know. And I never thought of that. But you had to say no in order to try to get what you had to the, you know, the most needy people. They have a lot of stuff and they do a lot of good, but it's not unlimited. And uh, so she was qualified for that. She said, I can do that. But most people don't want to. They get all squishy, you know. Yeah. Life is hard. I don't know. I wouldn't want that. Anna? Uh, when I first read this and then kind of think about it, uh, you think about cults. So much of this is, uh, it sounds like all the people get together and they share everything they have. And that sounds yeah. like a cult. Well, we have a negative view of cults. We think it's indoctrination and all these negative things. But in reading this, even though it sounds like a cult, it doesn't sound like a bad thing whatsoever. Um, the fact that nobody wanted for anything. Um, the other thing I thought about was who evaluated the need. You know, how, how can, who, who was to say that Tracy's need was um, any less or more than somebody else's. I mean, who put, who put the value of it, or how did they determine in this cultish environment what the need was? Nobody needed anything. Is it just basics, just the food, just the food and the clothing and whatever, that, the basics? And if that's the case, that is certainly different than us now because we place a value on what we think people need or what's too much. You take a person who is, say, unhoused. How much should their if we're gonna if we're gonna see that they have housing, how much should the housing be worth? You know, we want to put place values on things. It sounds like they really didn't place value and they weren't as judgmental as we are, so. In terms of where I see myself, um, I would hope that I am as liberal in my thinking and not as judgmental and placing value on what somebody else has as it sounds like they were. But I think at, at my core, I would say, well, they, if, if we're going to give them housing, if we're going to give somebody housing, it shouldn't be over an X amount because then they would have too much and then they wouldn't work or whatever. Just like they're saying now, if you don't work, you can't get snack or whatever. You know, they have to evaluate them. So there are a lot of things that I see here that, that I think are awfully great. That, for that time, it was awesome. But we are, we, we don't, I can't say everybody. But there's certainly a group or a people who don't feel that this is the right way to go. Because it keeps people from owning or making a contribution to their survival. Vicki, I think, was going to say Well, <coughs> I just had an idea that 
Vicky, if, did you have something? Yes. Can you hear me? <clears throat> yeah, I can. Uh, if, I mean, I think I'm really generous, and, you know, we can pat ourselves on the back sometimes because we, do, we are. It, you know, I feel like I've been blessed, and I'm real generous, and I'm real happy about that. And then, but I think about if I was asked, like in this church group or even in this Sunday school, to give everything mm -hmm. and lay it on the table and then have it divided, even though I love all you guys, it'd be really hard to do that. And some of these people, like he owned land, and that's valuable. So if he sold, sells his land and he has nothing, and he puts it all on the table, and then he takes this little bit that he needs for food, you know, when he needs it or they give it to him, um, I think that'd be really hard for us to do because we are materialistic. I mean, we just are, and and that, you know, that that would be hard to do. That I think it was a diff, you know, it was a different time. It was a different place, but um, yeah, that's an important point. You know, you have to. You were asking about the context, and you were talking about a, probably a small group, and that's probably true. And we live in a very complex world today. I'm sorry to say, a very divided world today, mm -hmm. but. Uh, Things Sam, Sam Bridget, bit, Bridget has something to say here. Right? I don't know if you if you have yeah, yeah, the Dallas I'm Life Foundation. I haven't okay. forgotten. Okay, go the, ahead. The Dallas Life Foundation downtown, which is the largest homeless shelter in Del in the North Texas, that's where I found God. Mm -hmm. um, and what, when you were talking about, and I, I worked there as a, a paid employee after I graduated the program, and <clears throat> it was hard for me. I worked as the assistant to the administrator in security. And I was the one responsible for passing out passes for people to get food or to get off the, off the property, go and do their jobs or whatever. And it was real hard for me to say no because I was in their shoes. I graduated the program. I went through everything they were just starting to go through. And it was real hard for me to say no until my boss had told me about the value of saying no to help people grow. Okay, you have to be able to say no in order for them to learn structure when they've had no structure, being homeless in the street, drug addicts or whatever. Mm -hmm. I myself am a recovering drug addict. So <clears throat> it was real hard at first. I mean, when I jumped into Dallas Life, I was there for two years. And I mean, I jumped in full force. I mean, I was on TV and I was a poster child, all kinds of stuff. God just put me in all kinds of places. And it just really gave me value. Then I understood what she meant about people having to, you have to say no in order for them to grow within themselves and to know what, what, if what, if what they're asking you is really a need or a want. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing I learned from that, with, with working for her, and I love working there. I still mm -hmm. volunteer with her. Sam, I've always, I've always wondered, the, the thing that intrigued me about this story, and I think all these people thought that Jesus was coming back really soon, so... There was no real motivation for me to hang on to this stuff because mm -hmm. Jesus is coming back so quickly. Mm -hmm. But my thought during that time was, it's a, I'm a, I can't imagine how much we could do if we didn't have to worry about things, if we didn't have to go to work to do this, if we could, you know, we would spend our time doing good if all of our needs were taken care of. And I think that's a, it's a kind of a utopian thought, but um, I think that's kind of what they were thinking during that time. Yeah, what if, of course I'm a math guy, so what if, Everyone contributed 5% of what they had. Nationwide, we wouldn't have to have welfare. We wouldn't have to have a lot of things that we have. So the data shows us, I'm pretty sure, that people who are more disadvantaged actually help each other more, mm -hmm. a lot more, than people who are affluent help each other. So uh, I've, I've, I've witnessed that several years ago uh, in Compass class, uh, one of our members befriended a homeless guy, his name was John Morgan, and John uh, was really down and out. He was living on the street, and we started doing things to help John. And I'll say this about any time you do something like that, if you think the road is going to be all smooth and everything you do is going to fall right in place and that person is just going to come right out of it and become like you and me, that is not so. That road has a lot of potholes in it. And you just have to understand that that's going to happen. You have to take people where they are and what they do I remember I took him to breakfast one morning and we walked back out to our car and he collapsed on the sidewalk. 
I mean, literally collapsed on the sidewalk. I was able to get him back in the car, and I took him to Parkland. And I didn't know what to do. I just took him to Parkland because he'd been there before. He later got a job at the uh, Omni Hotel. And Steve Blow, do y'all remember Steve Blow? Steve's a member here, you know. Steve Blow wrote an article about him one Christmas Day, one of his Christmas Day articles about John Morgan. And John's still around. We see John from time to time. And that road is still not smooth. So when we think about helping people, uh, just understand, you, it may not work out the way you actually think it's going to work out. But does that keep us from doing it? No. Yeah. Should. Okay, anybody else? Would you find yourself in this story? Okay, well, another question he gave me was, uh, what intrigues you or disturbs you about this story? Does anything disturb you about this story? Brian, anything disturb you about this story? Well, I think what, what Vicki said, I think that was, you know, kind of a... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kind of unsettling, yeah. Sam, the questions are right behind you on the board. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Carol. Wow. Thank you, Pat. I don't have eyes in the back of my head. <laughs> I thought you were a teacher. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this is called good. divine intervention. I'm between glasses right now. My viewers are coming in about a week, and I'm just between. I see good without them that far, but up here, you know, it's, it's a mess. It? I can't hear, I can't see. <laughs> You look good, though. Y'all yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. don't have all that remember stuff, do you? Yeah. You ever go from one room to the house to the other, go get something, get to that room and wonder, why did I walk in here? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Mom always told me, yeah. you yeah. go yeah. to the back yeah. through the door and you'll remember. That's yeah. called Destinasia. Destinasia. <laughs> 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 in church, you know, at CRS, they say, yeah, well, yeah. they stuff, okay, can't remember stuff. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it kind of reminds me of uh, relationships. If you're around them long enough, there'll be that day that you're asked to do 100%. I'm whatever. sorry, I can't hear I said it's like a, like a marriage or any relationship. If you're around them long enough, there'll be that day that comes along that, that you're asked to put all in. And, um, you know, it's just that's just part of life, and I think the church is like that in this spot. There wasn't a uh, commandment that said 10%, or it wasn't a commandment that said to give everything. That's what they wanted to do at that time, and that's what they needed to do at that time. That would scare me to give everything I have, because that's just how I feel. You would, it, I would have fear that well, what I gave I don't want to say that. Not get. <clears throat> let's see. The difference between want and need is there. So it's brought up before. Mm -hmm. You know, there's that part of me that wants, and if I give up everything, it's very scary. You know, very definitely, definitely scary. I mean, how do you how do you make it the next week if you give up everything you have? Yeah. Yeah. Let's do Pat, and then we'll come back to you again. You said what disturbs me? I made the mistake of going on and reading Acts 5. Oh, that, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh. yeah. <laughs> um, we think it's a parable. We hope it's a parable. <laughs> In Acts 5, do you know what happens? Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't. Please tell me. The, there was a married couple. And they agreed to give everything, just like in chapter 4, that they held back part of it. And the man came to, to give his portion. He said, this is everything I own. And uh, who was it? Said, no, it's not. And he was struck dead. And they took him out and buried him. His wife came in. And she said, here's everything I have. And they said, no, it's not. And she was also struck dead, and they took her out and buried her. It's Peter. 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 Said, Peter said, thank you. Mm. So, yes, ma'am. be careful about reading for a Stick with the I have to see What was I going to say? Tell me your name again. I'm Bridget. 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 Oh, Bridget. I don't remember what I was going to say now. <laughs> 
Well, you know, It'll come back. I hope I make this real short, but there was a lady in our neighborhood on our Facebook neighborhood page, and she had she needed food. She needed groceries. So i not bragging about what I did, but I took groceries. I couldn't find her. I, I gave part of them to a neighbor of hers because she, anyway, it was a long story. So finally, we kept meeting up on Facebook, and I met her in a parking lot, and I gave her all these groceries and stuff, and she had a son that was probably 18 or with her. I wondered why he's not working. So, but I, I feel good about it. You know, I do stuff like that sometimes, and I try not to talk about it. But anyway, so yesterday, I saw on the same Facebook page, and I recognized the name, and she said she has cancer, like cervical cancer. She can get show you proof that she has you know, that the doctor has said this and says something about her husband has done this and this, and I'm thinking, she had no husband when I met her. You know, so it's, you get really, you get burned, mm -hmm. so it makes you real reluctant to do, that's why it's really neat to have people on co the committees we have at church, like our missions, for example, that you give to that, and they've checked everything out. I've been on that committee, so... They check these things out, and it goes through like White Rock or something like that, and and you know those people are legitimately needy. Now I'm not saying that girl didn't need food because she she was so grateful, and she put it on Facebook that you know people had come through for her, and she can live the next two or three months. She stored up you know food in the pantry and all that kind of stuff, so it's okay. I could do that, but you you do get burned, and I've been burned before. But I don't think God wants you to stop doing for people. So if you do it with the right heart, then you're blessed, which is not particularly why you do it, but you do it to bless them. But in the end, you get the blessing. But you also, it's between them and God. I mean, if they are not honest with you about their needs, then that's really their problem because they lied to you. And that's between them and God. But, you know, it, it does taint your <clears throat> willingness sometimes to give. And be, you know, just help the person on the street corner that selling flowers or, you know. So it makes it, I mean, we're all, you get a little cynical sometimes mm -hmm. when you do that and you get burned and then you think, I'm not doing that ever again. And then, <laughs> you know, so you have to. I remember now. When you were talking about um, having to, like, give up everything that you have, back in those days, they had so much faith that they just believed that if they gave everything, they would be okay. Like, what's the parable in the Bible about the woman that gives up her last bit of flour for her son, mm -hmm. and she never went hungry again? So they, back then, they had, they had a lot of faith that if they did what they were asked to do by the disciples or, or in their belief in Jesus, that it would be okay. Mm -hmm. They just knew it was going to be okay. You know, so, one of the things I think about okay. gifts... Uh, giving is not a quid pro quo thing. Yeah. A lot of times we give somebody something and then two months later we say, I didn't even get a thank you note from them about that. And we get upset about that. Well, gifts don't have strings. They shouldn't have strings attached to them. In other words, Ray, if I give you something for Christmas and you want to give it to Goodwill tomorrow, fine. You know, that should be okay. I shouldn't hold that against you. Instead, what we do is uh, somebody tells me, well, Ray just gave that radio you gave him to Goodwill yesterday. Dad, damn it, I'm not giving him anything again. <laughs> so, uh, kind, uh, Vicki, I think that's kind of what you're saying. You know, you just can't have a string yeah. attached to it. It may not work out the way you think, but it's still a gift. Right. right. God says to be a cheerful giver, yeah. expecting nothing back. Laura? I... When I think about this, and I think about its placement in Acts, Acts is just kind of a period of upheaval in the church and development of the church. And I kind of view this as a model of discipleship that we in the church want to look toward. Um, because this is in the middle, I mean, Stephen hasn't been stoned yet in this part of Acts. So I believe that this is supposed to be a model of discipleship. Very good. Very good. Is there some reason that 
Barnabas is singled out because what we're told about Barnabas, other than that he was a Levite and a native of Cyprus, is that he sold a field that belonged to him. It doesn't say that he sold everything that belonged to him, but he, at least maybe this was his only possession. But he sold a field, brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet, and that's what we're told about him. Mm -hmm. But that's not remarkable in light of earlier in the same paragraph, as many as own lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold, they laid it at the apostles' feet. So it doesn't sound like he has distinguished himself in what he's done. What is it that distinguishes him that he is singled out as the example that <laughs> comes before what Pat pointed out in the next chapter uh, happens later? I get that there's a contrast between those two stories, but I don't understand why <coughs> Barnabas was singled out from what had come before that. Yeah. Maybe because he was a Levi? Was there something yeah. significant? Well, that's what I'm wondering. Yeah. His, his uh -huh. Cyprian, Cypria, whatever the word is, because he was from Cyprus or because he was a Levi, did that have or some significance? Is that the preliminary kind of introducing him into the story and how he became partners with Paul? Like, he had this degree of faithfulness and that, you know, was in essence a... Like, is this the back, the prequel to, like, Paul and Barnabas's <laughs> travels and, I don't know, I'm just, it could, that's where he got introduced to the story, I don't know. I was just going to I think the, the significance of Barnabas being a Levite, that was the clergy class in, in the original, like, ancient Judaism, right, like, in, like Levites were the, the priests. So they were responsible for maintaining the temple. So the act of someone from that class giving up everything they can for this new church that was being developed makes it somewhat significant rather than anyone else giving up something. Just like you know, a rabbi came and gave all he had and gave it to this church. That would be significant to me. Maybe like he was setting the example point. because he was a Levite. Mm, yeah. Is that what yeah. you mean? Yeah. Like he was setting the example because he was a Levite, the he priest. Well, yeah, when he was a Jewish, yeah. Jewish yeah. religious leader, yeah. giving up all he had to yeah. this new Christian church. That's a good point. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, I've got some things. I, I ran across some things. Uh, let me just go through these things, and if there's something you want to interject, please interrupt me. That will be fine. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about his name, the son of encouragement. He was a Jew of the dispersion which means uh, he had been forced out of Israel after various forest conquests. So that has a lot to do with it. He had a generous spirit. He maintained an open attitude toward material wealth and all of that. So I, I found something that I call the 10 takeaways from today. <coughs> and uh, again, stop me if you... Uh, and of course, I don't do anything original. <laughs> Thank goodness for Dr. Google. <laughs> Dr. Google is a, one of my, I taught, you know, for a long time, and one time I said to my class, this was probably back in the early, 20, like 2010, 2011, and I said, uh, do you guys know about Google? I was really joking with them, you know, and they all turned and looked at each other and like, what is, of course he knows it. So it's like asking if they knew their name. Uh, first takeaway, during the years of Barnabas' service in the early church, there is no record of him ex obsessing about his reputation. You know, we see the news today. Do you see anybody obsessing about their reputation in the news today? You don't have to name any names because it goes across all parts of society, doesn't it? I think... We can be guilty of that sometimes, too. Uh, number two, Barnabas put others first, especially in providing encouragement and exhortation. I don't think we'll ever know the benefit of saying to someone, thank you, or the benefit of saying to someone, I care about you. I ran across a uh, quote last week that I'd like to tell you in relationship to this. It says, love is not always a grand gesture. 
Sometimes it can be found in the simple act of holding someone's hand. Isn't that true? And Barnabas was evidently one of those kind of people. Good luck doing that. Number three, his ministry in the church was distinguished by his substantial generosity. We see that in the, in the scripture we read today. And I don't know why he was singled out, Travis. I think it probably has to do with because he was with Paul. And maybe that was just the important story. You know, we see so many things today in the news, and we wonder, why was that one pointed out? There's so many of these other things. Well, maybe they just didn't find those other people. Barnabas was willing to take prudent risks, such as when he vouched for Paul's integrity as a genuine disciple of Jesus. When they started out together, Barnabas was the lead guy, and Paul was the follow-along guy. And then at a point during that their time together, that role switched. Now we say Paul and Barnabas, but actually when it started out, it was Barnabas and Paul. So that's another thing to take away there. He's, uh, he's known for his exceptional character qualities. Isn't that a wonderful thing? I know when we were looking for a new pastor a year ago, was anybody here on that committee? Anna, Anna was. Anna was. <clears throat> was, that a, was that a consideration? Character quality? Absolutely. Yes. 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 And our new music minister, I'm sure the same thing was true. So character has a lot to do with it. I had an incident happen, actually it was in 2016 now, and one of my, quote, friends said something to me in the neighborhood of how could somebody of your character, and I won't say what it was I'd done, how could someone of your character have done this? I got up, it was at a breakfast, I got up and went to my car and started crying. I could not stop crying because I thought my character just got run up the flagpole and there was no reason for that. And I finally got myself together and I called Peggy on my way home and I still remember that to this day, that when someone puts your character up the flagpole, it hurts. Mm -hmm. It really hurts. So being a person of character, and I'm not saying that my character is perfect, not at all, but something to consider. Barnabas recognized that serving as a disciple of Jesus involved more than just meeting the temporal needs of people. He realized there was more to it than just that. He was willing, he willingly faced the controversy that arose in his ministry of the gospel. Think about Wilson. Have we had any controversies around here? <laughs> and how have we faced them? And I like to say that we faced them with dignity and with transparency and not just jump the gun and ju jump in and do something. I remember the LGBTQ question here several years ago. And you know, a lot of people left over that. But I thought we handled that quite well when we actually, all of you were probably involved in discussion groups as I was, and we were all heard, and it was a church decision. It wasn't that George walked in and said, here's what we're going to do. So I really appreciate that. So we got to be willing to face those controversies. He was willing to forgive other believers. I don't know. I grew up conservative in a very conservative background, like probably many of you did. And I remember we didn't think much about Jews or Catholics. We kind of thought they were off the charts somewhere. I've come to realize their hearts are in the same place. I remember George Mason being asked at Richland College, I was teaching there, he came out and had a dialogue with David Stern, his good friend David Stern, and one of the students asked George a question, a very hard question. Do you think Jews are going to be in heaven? And George said, it's not my theology, but it is my hope. And I thought, what a brilliant answer that was. It's not my theology, but it is my hope. So the trajectory of Barnabas' life included his work as an apostle, 
and as a prophet and as a teacher. So as we finish this morning, I would like for us to walk away with the idea of trying to look at Barnabas' life, how it reflects into our lives. Can we be those friends? Can we actually listen to someone else and help them when they need help and understand that it may not work the way we think it's going to? I really appreciate y'all's time. Dennis, it's 1040, and he okay. told me I had to stop by the <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, this is Dylan Rockwell that joined us as, as we started. So Dylan is here as well. And Bridget, thank you for being with our guest today. Too. Uh, I'll get name tags for both of you next week. Okay, let's look at our prayer request. Um, Deborah Alexander's husband, Ronnie, was in the ER. I don't know the details of it. I just got a text from, uh, from Deborah this morning. We need to pray for speedy recovery for Ronnie. Um, friend of uh, something for sure. What is this? Is this you? Uh, the couple that I stay next door to when I go to Florida, they, uh, where I just got home from yesterday, uh, she just had some, she went in for surgery on Tuesday and the doctor said, this is too extensive, I can't do it. But this is a Which, friend in Florida, yeah, so. Yeah, Good. and so she's waiting for a new surgeon to do this extensive surgery. Okay, Dale's good friend, Sam's mother, uh, Rachel, is in hospice um, uh, at, at T. Bain, uh, T-Bone over Pickens. Pickens, okay, that's it, yeah. So Dale's gone on that one. Speaking of Dale, I'm glad she's out right now. We, and I have I put it in the emails all the time, but we need to finalize a gift for for um, Robert. And that's going to be, several of you have already uh, donated to that. If you do want to do that, I think this is the month we need to get some money and get it back to Dale. Dale has already fronted the money for the for the, for the bench, the park bench that's there, that's in honor of Robert at White Rock Lake. He was one of our class members, he used to sit right here. And it was 95 or 96 when he died, and just an excellent, just an excellent man. At any rate, if you want to do that, let us know. Let's contribute to that. Let's finish it up this month, though, I think we'll do that. Do we give Dale that money, or say, say it again? Do we give Dale that money? Well, we're, or? We, were, we were you can if you want. If okay. you want to give it straight to Dale, it's fine. Otherwise, we're, other people have given it to Laura and I, or, okay. or Travis and Patty. We'll okay. we'll just give it as a class to them and go. What's uh, the cost? Say it again. What's the cost of the bench? Well, I don't know the overall number, but I'm hoping we can get close to 500 bucks or something like that. That's what I'm thinking. So you know, we'll see. But anyway, we'll do it. And some some of you have already donated, so. Do that. Okay. Any any other prayer requests before we go? Actually, I just realized my sister's mother-in-law, Mary Watkins, uh, went on hospice this week. She's not like she's not right at the end of life, but basically she's got a lot higher level of need. It's actually kind of a gift because they're going to have access to more resources with her being designated as hospice. So it's Andrea's mother-in-law. Yes, yeah. okay. Mary Watkins. Okay. Her is she, is she in Tennessee? Or? She, they've moved her to, uh, yeah, she's in outside. Nashville. She's in Nashville. Okay. Yeah. In Nashville Franklin, actually. All right. Anything else? Thank you for coming. We appreciate, you know, Bridget and, and Bill, we appreciate you guys being here with us, and we'll hope you come back to see us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and the time that you can come and study your scripture and study uh, about Barnabas. Um, I hope I can be more like that with an encouragement. Father, we thank you for the time that Sam put into the lesson and his preparation, and we appreciate his delivery today. We pray for Ronnie Alexander, who's been in the ER on Friday, that he might get his health restored uh, and get back to us. We pray for um, Vicki's friend in Florida who's awaiting surgery. We pray for Dale uh, Cohen's good friends, Pam's mother, who is um, Rachel, who's in hospice, at uh, T-Bone Pickens, Stephen Pickens, and we pray for Diana's sister, Andrea's mother-in-law, uh, who has been entered in, has entered into hospice. Give her good last days and conversations with uh, family and friends. Father, we thank you for Wilshire. Thank you for our staff, and help us be your hands and feet in this part of the world. And I we pray, Amen. Amen. It's good to meet you. Oh, I have a question.
I know. Just thrilled. Hey, All right, to the nursery. Hey, 